The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information about Shiloh Presbyterian Church is available at shilohopc.org. Job chapter 31, we'll read the entirety of the chapter. As you turn there, I'd just like to say, uh, it's my privilege to be here. Thank you for letting me come. I'm from, I, I bring you greetings from Matthew's Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Pastor Troy said, please tell them I said hi. He was here, I guess, I suppose it was a few weeks ago now. Um, well, I'm sort of his sidekick, so if you know him. Um, so Job chapter 31, start in verse 1. Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does not he see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes, and if any spot has stuck to my hands, then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed toward a woman, and I have lain in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another. Let others bow down on her, for that would be a heinous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for that would be a fire that consumes as far as Abaddon, and it would, ret- it would burn to the root of all my increase. If I have rejected the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld anything that the poor desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it, for from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing, or the needy without covering, if his body has not blessed me, And if he is not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have faced his majesty. If I have made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand had found much, if I have looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor, And my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand. This also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for I would have been false to God above. If I have rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me, or exulted when evil overtook him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. If the men of my tent have not said, Who is there who has not been filled with his meat? The sojourner has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do by hiding my iniquity in my bosom because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me so that I have kept silence and did not go out of doors. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. If my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I have eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. The word of God. Amen. may be seated. Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, we sit as Christians, those who are declared righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. At the same time, Lord, that and our justification, uh, we're so thankful, Lord. We pray for your power, not just to overcome the guilt of our sin, but also to overcome the power of our sin. We pray through sanctification, Lord, through the work of your spirit, that you would make us more righteous, Father. We pray that you would accomplish this, you would accomplish whatsoever you would in this word. Uh, You are free. You are sovereign, but we pray, Lord, that you would make us more like Jesus, which is your good will and your good pleasure to do. And we pray all these things and plead it on the basis of the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. In Psalm 23, and you're familiar with that psalm, David writes, 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And what I found fascinating, I was translating that, and I found it fascinating. The word for paths is also a word, it, it has a little bit broader meaning than just paths. It also means ruts, tracks, entrenchments. You think of a place where sheep would go and habitually go led out to the field and led back from the field. It would sort of make a groove in the ground, an entrenchment in the ground. And that's sort of what he's getting at in that passage. So the idea here uh, in Psalm 23 is that Jesus leads his people in ruts of righteousness. Righteousness isn't just a flash in a pan. Uh, It's not just a hat that you put on from time to time and take it off. Righteousness is a well-worn lifestyle. It's a set habit of the heart. First John talks about walking in the light, a habitual way of life, because day by day, the good shepherd sheep are supposed to be led by familiar tracks that their feet know all too well, the ruts of righteousness. Lately in my church, we've encountered lots of counseling, lots of people who've started to wander off the ruts of righteousness. I read this and, and was really cut to the heart, and I thought, wow, this is a timely sermon uh, for those that want to get back on the ruts of righteousness, that want to continue in the entrenchments following the shepherd. And that's why we're looking at Job 31 this morning. Uh, We're looking at Job 31 this morning because Job is a righteous man. Uh, And chapter 31 is Job's final defense saying, I'm righteous, relatively righteous. Uh, And even though Job's friends don't think he's righteous, we know he is because God says he is. In Job chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord says to Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Flawless man, no. Perfectly righteous, no. Righteous, accounted righteous, only for the blood of Christ, yes. But broadly speaking, in the biblical sense, he is a righteous man who levies his defense. So Job 31 gives us a sneak peek into the life of a righteous man. And this morning, we'll look at Job 31 for clues about how to walk in those ruts of righteousness Uh, And when we look into this righteous man's heart, the three things we'll see, and we'll see in the sermon, first, we see a fear of God. And second, we see that this man is realistic about sin. He calls it what it is. And third, we see a thoroughness of obedience that comes out of this righteous man's heart. So we'll see fear of God, a realism about sin, and a thoroughness of obedience. So let's look first at the fear of God that Job exhibits. I think Probably the most consistent beat that I see in this chapter is that Job is obsessed by the fear of God. Even though all his friends keep talking about what a total miscreant, what a total loser he must be, he's really only concerned about what God thinks. Verse 6, but let me be weighed in a just balance. Let God know my integrity. See that. And he craves vindication from God above all else. He says, if God vindicates me, surely Verse 35, let the Almighty answer me. So here's my working definition of the fear of the Lord from Job 31. It's being so in awe of God that we care the most about what he thinks and about how he'll react to the things that we're doing. The fear of the Lord. And this definition is borne out by Job. The first part of the definition, he's in awe of God. To Job, God was so massive, so beautiful, so fiery, he was terrified of crossing God. See that in verse 23. It says, I was in terror of calamity from God. I could not have faced his majesty. Job was even scared of crossing God in secret. He knew God's eyes were always on him. He says in verse 4, doesn't he see my ways and number all of my steps? So he has an awe of God, and because of this awe, secondly, Job is concerned about how he looks in God's eyes. In verse 28, it says the reason that he guarded himself from idolatry was he didn't want to be false in God's eyes, to be false to God above. He didn't want to deny his God, be seen as false to God. And then third, Job is the most concerned here about how God will react to the things that he, to what he is, to what he does. In verse 14, he says, If I oppress those who depend on me, what then shall I do when God rises up? See, he's concerned about what the, those he oppresses think, but he's more concerned, what shall I do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? It says, I'm going to apply this to you. Is this you, beloved? Are you wowed by God's might 
and his majesty and his glory, so much so that what he is impacts what you do. You should be, because if you're not, it's not that he's not that big, it's just that you're that blind, you see. Or is there a constant awareness somewhere deep in your consciousness that God is seeing everything you do? Um, The righteous should live every moment as though they could feel the eyelash of God upon the back of their neck, so they can know that he's even with them in the room. If you don't have this awe, if you don't have this awareness, this is something that you need. Something, what part of what it means to walk with God. Um, because fear is actually one of the best safety mechanisms you could ever have. Let me explain what I mean by that. I, I've thought before when I used to work at a lumber mill, I worked there for 10 years, and I used to think then that uh, the fear of the Lord works a little bit like a chain break on a chainsaw. Uh, when I used to work at a sawmill, a lot of our chainsaws had the safety mechanism on them. So when the chainsaw kicked too much a certain way, uh, when it kind of got out of control and the man left, let go of the hand guard, the chain would stop and the chainsaw would stop working. The reason we had these chainsaws uh, and these safeties on these chainsaws, chainsaws are really dangerous. Uh, I knew a couple of guys who put chainsaws in their legs and, and cut off limbs and fingers and things. Uh, that's kind of how the fear of the Lord works for the righteous too. When we're in the rut of righteousness, when we're in the groove where we're supposed to be cutting, you know, we're okay. We're, fear, we're respecting this instrument. This instrument could cut off our hands, right? This instrument is dangerous, we're, but we're cutting okay in the fear of the Lord. But when our life starts to kick out of the rut, uh, when we start to let go of the hand guard, we're supposed to have this fear safety mechanism that stops us dead in our tracks. Uh, we need this safety mechanism because God is far more dangerous than any chainsaw. So here's here's how it works practically every day. So when you're about to look at something bad on a computer screen, this awareness of God should stop you like a chain break. Stop. What does God think about this? God's here. Uh, Or when you're about to fire an unkind word at someone, it's right on the tip of your tongue, and and, and you think, and oh, a God awareness. It stops you dead in your tracks, makes you reconsider, uh, brings grace back to your mind. Uh, This worked this way for the people of Israel too. Moses tells the people of Israel in Exodus 20, 20, God has not come in order to test you, or no, God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. See how that works. So God will test you. And in that test, the fear of God is your safety makes you think of his presence, makes you think about what he thinks, makes you so in awe of him that you don't want to go forth with that sin anymore. So if you don't have the safety, pray for it. Really, really pray for it, that God would make you see him more as he is and fear him like you ought. So that's the first thing we see from this righteous man. We see the fear of the Lord, really very alive for Job. Second thing we see about Job is he's very realistic about sin. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of the time we talk about sin, um, we speak about it in pretty familiar terms sometimes, speak about it vaguely. Sometimes sin talk doesn't always have a lot of teeth to it. Um, we can read something like the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 84, and it, it can feel clinical and detached, right? You can read, what does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come, and um, Something that comes with the hardening of a heart or with familiarity that sometimes you can read that uh, sin deserves God's wrath and curse and both in this life and that which is to come. Think about what, how angels would tremble reading something like that. And I know lots of us here could say in truth, I know I deserve punishment. I know I deserve hell. But with conviction, with conviction. So one of the things I love about chapter 31 of Job is that Job is very conscious of what God thinks about sin. And Job is very specific about the sinfulness of sin. In fact, it's hard to read Job 31 as a Christian sinner and not feel like you're being punched in the gut. What Job does so well in chapter 31 is he illustrates God's retributive justice, his God's you'll get what you deserve justice in ways that we can understand and relate to, concrete, specific ways. He's very explicit about what a sin is really saying about a person. It says, what you do says something about who and what you are. It's explicit about what sin really deserves. 
both in this life and the life to come. So let's look at a few of these sins. We'll look at every single one exhaustively, but as test cases, not only to see what each sin would say about Job and what each sin would have deserved for Job, but to see what each sin would say about you, uh, to see what each sin should earn for you. So consider first, the first sin he takes up is the sin of impure eyes, Um, eyes that wander, eyes that linger too long on the wrong thing. Job says he's careful with his eyes, and really, in summation, he's careful with his eyes because the things you take in with your eyes can really pollute you. He asks, what would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? In, In the context of what he looks at with his eyes, what would be... My portion from God above, my heritage from the Almighty on high. God, Job knows that filthy eyes aren't worthy of inheriting the kingdom of God. That keeps him from lustful looking. Guys, you have to think. Every time you, you catch yourself, uh, your, your eyes are unclean, your lusts are unchecked, you're polluting yourself. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you're, in a very real sense, you're disqualifying yourself from the kingdom through that sin. Makes you think when, when the next pop-up comes up, makes you think, is this how I want to live before God most high? Jesus Christ, who's purchased my inheritance, and here I am disqualifying myself for that inheritance. Worse than that, Job is pretty clear about what impure eyes deserve. You know, we think about, well, I wasn't careful with my eyes. And, but he's very specific. He says, is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity? He's thinking about just what his eyes look at, and he, his, eye, his thoughts run to calamity, disaster. He says, undisciplined eyes deserve chaos, unexpected ruin. That's what chaos is. He's saying, if you have a hard time keeping your eyes on what is true, noble, just, and pure, he says, take a hard look at what God says you deserve. It's not just a little thing. It's a big thing. Okay, so that's the sin of impure eyes. And he hits that really hard. And that might seem like a sin that seems like the least of all sins to us, right? Well, how about the sin of unjust gain, verses 7 and 8? This is uh, the sin of deceit. This is playing the system. This is putting one over on somebody. This is getting something the wrong way. Here's what this sin says about a person. Verse 7, if my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes and if any spot has stuck to my hands. See, isn't that beautiful poetry? It says, if you're a deceiver, it says, first of all, you're out of God's way. Uh, My heart has gone after my eyes you're being led on a leash by your desires. Desires just kind of leading you out off, off, off of God's track. And then it says, spot is stuck to my hands. It's a stain. You're gaining things uh, unrighteously and your hands are, are dirtied, caught red-handed. So here's what that sin deserves. Verse 8, he says, let me sow and another eat. Let what grows for me be rooted out. If you've gained anything unjustly, you deserve to have it torn from you justly. If deceit has been your tool for getting what you want, he says you should never be allowed to have anything good. Let it be torn from you. So that's the sin of unjust. See how specific he gets about these things, what these things deserve? Okay, how about the sin of adultery? This is the one he's most explicit about. He's saying if you've ever wanted a man or a woman who's not your spouse, here's what this sin says about you. Verse 9, he says, If my heart has been enticed towards a woman... Or better translation would be that word there, enticed, means to be simple or deceived in heart towards a woman, meaning that adultery is foolish. Saying if you have an adulterous heart, you're foolish. Second half of that verse, if you have lain in wait at my neighbor's door. Don't just read neighbor here, read friend, read companion, read comrade. You see, an adulterer, a coveter is a betrayer even before the act, is a betrayer. That's not the worst of it. Then he says what a coveter deserves. He says in verse 10, let my wife grind for another, let others bow down on her. This scripture is pretty graphic. I I sort of hold back from explaining in fullness what this means in mixed company, but this is saying that he who lusts after another man's wife deserves to have his wife lust after another man. And there's even an idiom here meaning being in bondage servitude to another man physically. That's verse 11, for that would be a heinous crime. He, he steps it up again. He, he steps up the, 
the penalty for this. He says, for that would be a heinous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. Read in heinous, read infamous. Something that makes you renowned for your, for your horrible crime. Uh, drug before the judges, the, the sin of adultery in Old Testament Israel was, was death. It's a sin that deserves death. It steps up again. Verse 12, for that would be a fire that consumes as far as Abed, and Abed is the place of destruction, the afterlife, and it would burn to the root of all my increase. He's saying, if you can't control the burning of your lust, you, you deserve to have it burned all the way to hell uh, and have it ruin every good thing in your life along the way. And Job goes on like this in detail in his vindication of himself. He says in verses 21 and 22, if you raise your hand to oppress the poor and you think that other people will support you in the gate, he says you deserve to have your hand fall off. Uh, if you make a habit of hiding your sins, cherishing sins close to your bosom, he says in 33 and 34, you're a coward who deserves your own self-imposed isolation. And he, he goes on like this, so on and so on. And so after all these vivid descriptions of sins and all of what they deserve, I have to ask you, the sin that you're harboring, the sin that you're cherishing, what is it saying about you? What does it really deserve? And fear helps us in two ways here. Fear, first of all, motivates you to want to look more lovely than that. We all, if we're fearing God, we, we care about what God thinks about us, right? We care about how we look before the Lord. We don't want to be seen that way. So ladies, when you fall in love with a guy, uh, the last thing you want to do before you're betrothed or before you're married or whatever is to have him come over early in the morning and surprise you, the hair sticking up in the air and your retainer in your mouth and and you know that the betrothal, you know that he loves you, you know it's not going to deter him, he's going to still pursue you at the same time. The l- love isn't at stake here, but you still, you care what he sees in you. You care what you look like before him. It's sort of a fear. Fear, or the constant awareness of God, drives us to shed off our sin and to live in the light, to want to look lovely before him. It's the kind of fear that prompted Joseph to cry out to Potiphar's wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He cared what God thought. Secondly, fear promotes self-examination. If you fear God, then you're constantly seeing yourself through the Scripture's eyes, seeing yourself through His eyes. And what do you see? You might see a child of God who's kicking against the sins that are trying to ensnare him. You might see a warrior who's fighting against sins. Or you might see a liar, a coveter, a murderer who's heading towards getting what they deserve. Well, if you have a healthy fear of cancer, especially if you have a history of cancer, you check yourself, right? Check yourself to see if this deadly malady is still in your system constantly. Well, a healthy fear of God, a healthy fear of the eternity that God represents, causes you to check yourself too. A fear of the Lord causes us to check ourselves and to see what we must look like through his eyes. A fear of the Lord causes Job to be realistic about his sin, causes us to be realistic about our sin too. So we talked about Job's fear of the Lord, talked about how realistic this passage is about sin, and let's talk last about thoroughness of obedience. Fear of God doesn't just make us serious about sin, also makes us really thorough in our obedience too. If you look at Job in chapter 31, the fear of the Lord keeps him from committing, this is a list of sins that he hasn't done, at least in full. Uh, The fear of the Lord kept him from committing all these different sins. It kept him from lustful eyes, unjust gain, adultery, haughtiness, severity, greed, apathy toward the needy, oppression, idolatry, love of the world, revenge, inhospitality, hiding sin, and murder. And he probably lived around the time of Abraham, we think, before Moses' giving of the law. And yet, God-fear causes Job, this God-fearing man, to want to obey God with the strictness that Jesus represents in the Sermon on the Mount. And so all throughout Job 31, Job's concerned with whole obedience. He's concerned with head, hands, and heart obedience, obedience that penetrates deep into his person, righteousness. So look first at his his head obedience. Uh, It's not just about the things that Job was trying to avoid. It's about the things that Job was trying to do, not just the sins of commission, but but, but righteousness of commission, omission. Well, whatever I'm saying. Okay, so in Job 13 through 15, 31, 13 through 15, he says, He's got some really good theology behind these things. Uh, he says he, he can't just look down on his servants, dismiss his underlings, because, well, here's his theological good head reason, his head reason. Did not he who made me in the womb make him? Did not one fashion us both in the womb? 
He's got good theology here. He's saying, I, I can't mistreat some, one of my underlings because they're image bearers. They're created beings just like I am. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 4, who made them to differ? It's only the good Lord who made them to differ. Good theology is driving his household. Okay, so then look at his right action. He upholds all of his actions, the things that he did from the fear of the Lord, his orthopraxy. So his orthodoxy, his orthopraxy. He's not just interested in thinking rightly, he's interested in doing rightly too. Verse 18, For from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. He's always taking care of the underdog. Verse 32, The sojourner has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the travelers. And interesting, this morning we prayed about stealing. Here's Job saying about how he hasn't stolen from people. We talked about the refugee crisis, and here he is taking care of sojourners. God always brings things to mind when, in the most marvelous ways. But here's Job. He, he's keeping his door open to foreigners, to people he doesn't even know. He's giving us insight into not only the sins that he avoids, but the righteousness that he pursues. And then last, look at his, his orthopathy, his heart obedience. He's keeping his heart with all diligence. The fear of God made his heart sensitive, made his conscience soft. So sensitive that he knows how easy it is for his heart to be tricked. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, he talks about how a heart can be fooled and enticed into adultery. We looked at that already. Okay, now look at verse 26. He talks about how open he is to the sin of idolatry. I might have missed it the first time. It's a little subtle. He says, if I have looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor, and my heart has been secretly enticed. He knows that even just the beauty of nature can subtly, and especially in a culture that worships the forces behind nature, he knows that even these things can slowly seduce his affections and steal his heart off of God. He says, even if, even if, if this is happening to me, I don't want it. Here's the bottom line. The fear of the Lord made Joshua want to do anything he could for the Lord. I think of it this way. Have you ever looked up to someone so much that you did everything you could to please them? Maybe it was that coach and you'd run extra laps for that coach because you love that coach. Maybe it's that teacher and you'd put that little extra edit into the paper or an extra paragraph into the paper because, well, this is, this is, Mr., this is Mr., Mr. Hughes I'm, I'm doing this paper for, right? Why did you do it? Did you do it because they were such an unlikable curmudgeon with unrealistic, unrealistic expectations? No, probably not, right? probably did it because you were impressed by them, because you respected them, because you cared what they thought, because fear an awful lot of the time looks a lot like love, doesn't it? It's that way with God. In God, you have the perfect mix of sheer magnitude and intimate tenderness. All of that by itself is enough to inspire us to want to think and do and feel righteously for him. And so it is that the larger God looms in your vision, the more of him your eyes are open to see, the more you realize you really can't be too thorough in your obedience for him. So I want to conclude, note of hope. The scripture sort of, it's, it's the law, it cuts to the heart. I want to close with the word, it's encouraging. Job's a God-fearing man. The credit for Job's righteousness doesn't go to Job. This isn't a sermon that extols Job. It's reserved for another. So return with me one more time to that verse we started with. Psalm 23, 3, it says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what keeps Job in the ruts of righteousness? Although he, he sins in the book of Job, but what keeps him generally in the ruts of righteousness? It's, well, so Psalm 23, he does. Who's he? It's the shepherd. Who's the shepherd? Well, it's Jesus. It's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. At the end of the sermon, if you're left with the idea that, okay, pastor's talking about I need, I need more fear of the Lord, and if you're left with the impression that somehow you need to fire up within yourself some sort of fear for God, you need to drum up within yourself some more fear feeling. Okay, what music can I listen to? What, what can I do to drum up this fear feeling? I've done you a disservice if that's what you're left with at the end of this service. Not one of us here today, not even Job, walks in ruts of righteousness by our own strength. We're too weak for that. None of us actually even sees the ruts of righteousness. We're apart from the good shepherd. We're, we're too blind for that. So how come Job is able to make a covenant with his eyes? How come he's able to shut his mouth from slander? How come he's able to love his enemies uncompromisingly? 
It's because the Spirit of Christ was working in him, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. How come Job isn't dismissed outright from God's presence? You notice at the end of this, Job is crying out for, here's my signature, let the Almighty answer me. You think, if I were to come before God and plead my righteousness as the case for which I should stand before him, what would, what would that earn me? How come he's able to stand there with that boldness, demanding a hearing from the Almighty on high? Well, it's because he knows that his Redeemer lives. Job 19.25, or he has a high priest who can sympathize with his weaknesses, who will be tempted in all ways like me, yet without sin. And brothers and sisters, I... At the end of the sermon, I want you to see how radically important it is that you fear God, but I want you to be discouraged by the fact that you can't make yourself fear God more. I want you to be comforted by the fact that he will lead you into godly fear if you ask and seek and knock. You can fear him more. You have not reached a height of fear that you cannot fear him more. You have to ask him for fear. Don't you think he'll be pleased to give it to you? You have to seek out the object of your fear in the word and in the world and you'll find him, he promises. You have to knock on his door, you have to bang incessantly and insistently for his personal presence, and the door will be open to you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Have you wandered off the ruts of righteousness? You need to get back on it, not just because the night is scary, not just because there's wolves that are scary, not just because starvation is scary. You need to get back on it because that's where your shepherd is. He's the only one who's strong enough to carry you and wise enough to guide you, merciful enough to come and get you when you've lost your way. And consider that this scripture too, this morning, might even be one of the crooks he used uh, to drag you back into the ruts of righteousness and keep you on the way. So I'm saying at the end of the sermon, I'm saying fear him. That's right, I'm telling you, fear the good shepherd. But fear too looks an awful lot like love, doesn't it? So let's pray and ask for what we don't have within ourselves. Father, we heard this morning from Pastor Hughes. We're by nature children of wrath, but by grace, children of God. We don't fear you as we ought. We don't love you as we ought. Even the warmest of our hearts is still so cold compared to what it will be in glory. So we pray, Father, put that safety on us, that fear. Put that, that broader vision of you, that awe, that glimpse of more of your majesty, you know, Lord, show us your glory. As Moses prayed, make us to fear you so we can follow you, so we can be more like Christ and make us always and forever depend on Christ, who is our standing in righteousness and who is the one who grows us in righteousness after his own image from day to day, from faith for faith. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.